Hello and welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick, episode six with myself Ryan, we got Sam and we got Jackson. Hey. On today's episode, we're going to start off things with uh, Sam giving us a bit of industry update. Then we're going to move on to, um, well, basically it's a review of bad films. We've obviously done a lot uh, in terms of the Oscars over the last few weeks and, and reviewed other films. So we thought, let's have a look at some of the worst films in the history of cinema. Um, and then we're going to move on and be joined by Katrina Gray, who we've actually had the pleasure of working with in one of our up and coming features, Decline. Um, and I co-starred with her in that. Uh, so yeah, she'll be joining us, and Sam's going to take us through an interview with her. Um, yeah, so let's get on with it, guys. So uh, Disney's CEO, Bob Iger, stepped down. He is no longer in charge. Apparently he's going to be more involved with creative stuff. This is uh, really pissed off the stock markets. When was it that he took, when was it that he took over? Like... I think he's been in control. I, I don't know if... For sure, but I know it's been around between five and ten years. I don't know how long exactly. But a guy called Bob Chepepec, Chepe, Chepepec, or <laughs> he's uh, he's an interesting looking guy. Like I literally have never heard of him. Yeah. He sort of looks like um, like a goon, like like he was one of Bob Iger's heavies. Oh, <laughs> he doesn't look like, like a, a Disney face. But I suppose they can't always employ people that don't look Disney tastic. Although there was some weird image I saw, like um, of him and Mickey Mouse, or is it Minnie Mouse? And you just like I don't know if this is the guy to sell the company. <laughs> but the stock markets are not happy because this was not really like a big an uh, announcement or anything. It just sort of just kind of came out of nowhere. No one knew Bob Iger was stepping down, so it's a bit strange. He's not the one that runs. Portsmouth Football Club. No, that's Michael Eisenberg. And, oh, right, okay. Yeah. On the stock markets, things are looking quite questionable with the effect the coronavirus is going to have on the film industry. Really? It's having a direct effect on film? Yeah, essentially... That's bad. The it's having an effect on everything, I suppose, well, yeah. isn't it? Well, this is it. There are, there are two elements. Firstly, there's the fact that cinemas are closing. So in China, they've had cinemas closed for the last three weeks. Really? And obviously China at the moment have had quite a booming economy related to the box office, mm. especially when they shut down the release of uh, Western films to focus on films made in China. So that's kind of like messed everything up. Shit. On top of that, you have the fact that film shoots are being delayed. So Mission Impossible 7 was to be shot in Venice, but Italy has recently oh. had a coronavirus outbreak. North Italy. So this is affecting it. And they're saying that the, again, this all feels very cynical when you think about it. There's loads of illness going around. There's bigger issues here. I feel like but, our podcast kind of gone a slightly different way and like health no, no, this here. Is, <laughs> <laughs> it's still industry. They're saying that there's a predicted that there's going to be a four billion, um, yeah, four billion pound loss across the world from the box office due to the coronavirus. Yeah, I, I suppose you don't really want to go to the cinema when there's a contagious disease spreading. No. Like. Well, but if it's like known that it's in your area. Yeah, yeah. Right, so on to different points. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit of a downturn, but we're going to go yeah, to... Sounds miserable. <laughs> more of a, a quite serious and sad thing that's happened in the indie film industry more so. There's a film being released called Guns Akimbo. B-movie with Daniel Radcliffe, the director has essentially been accused of cyber cyberbullying and he's done it because in response to what he felt was bullying from critics but the critics that have been centered are very much uh, they're female and mostly black so it's kind of like although he's put a statement out saying it's not a race thing it's more he probably shouldn't have said anything in the first place and it's, it's this one thing where I've seen a lot of critics, especially on Twitter, because it started like blowing up on there. They're all like, we're not going to back this film. We're not going to promote this film. And the film distributor, Saban Films, have decided to still release the film Friday. Will it affect the box office? Potentially. But who knows? It's, it's one of those things where really the director, Jason Lee Howden, really should have just not said anything. He was unprovoked, wasn't he? It's not like he was involved in the middle of it all going yeah. on and he just decided to get involved. 
that's where Twitter is 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 a bad thing to get like don't get into arguments on Twitter. No. Never like it's it's dumb. It's dumb. And then on a final note, slightly more positive, I guess. Depending on your views on Indiana Jones, I guess. <laughs> Indiana Jones five, Steven Spielberg is no longer directing. Which kind of begs the question. What's the point in making the film? I don't like Steve, um, I don't like Steven Spielberg or Indiana Jones, but I appreciate that a lot of people do, and one of the reasons like he's stuck with it for four, four you, films. You sounded like you could hear the comments. Like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that was just my eyes in the back of his head. <laughs> <laughs> and from what's been told, is basically there's been this is Indiana Jones five has been delayed so many times because they can't get the script right, and they keep having problems with the script. And there was talk about more delays, and Disney want to push for their release because it's the, it'll be the first one under Disney. It'll be the, so it'd be a big kind of deal for them. And also, how long is Harrison Ford really going to be alive? He's, he's very old. There's old. only so many stunts an old man could do before it's CGI, and everyone kind of knows it's CGI. Do they know who's like in the cast yet? Are they bringing back like Shia LaBeouf? Well, this is the thing. Nothing's not... Because there's no script. And oh, okay. this is why Steven Spielberg who you'd think would be there from the end and would always be there at the end, has walked away. Mm. They're talking about getting James Mangold to replace, who recently did Ford, uh, yeah, Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah, and Logan. So he is a good director, but personally, like, why waste 150 million or 200 million or 300 million or whatever, how much money they're going to waste on it? Just let it go or reboot it. It's not that bad to reboot it. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> I know that uh, most people hate reboots, but I'd say, in my personal opinion, either watch it slowly crumble with the original creators or go in a different direction. So moving on, we're going to be reviewing um, three films, really. One of which is The Room. Uh, the other one is Birdemic. And the last one is more like a collection of films because they all kind of come under one umbrella by Neil, Neil Breen. <laughs> The creative artist that he is. The brain machine. The brain machine. <laughs> I like that. Um, so yeah, who wants to kick it off? Well, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this was because we recently watched uh, Birdemic, wasn't it? Mm. And I'd, I saw Birdemic like years ago. And the weirdest thing I always find about Birdemic is you forget about the first 45 minutes of the film. Because you know the other half is bad. You forget how bad the first half is. Where it's just... A love story of the most plain characters <laughs> to ever exist. And the weirdest love story. Uh, we, should, we should probably say there's going to be spoilers, but these films don't really have a fucking plot anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it's, like, it's not... You, you will get spoilers, but really the film is already spoiled as you're watching it. Um, it to be honest, I was just going to say that... Even if we do have spoilers in it, it's probably going to make you want to watch the film just for the <laughs> farcicalness of it all. It's just, yeah. You can find it so, somewhere on YouTube. Yeah, Birdemic. That, 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 like you said, started off as a, as a romance and then out of nowhere, there wasn't even a, a trigger, there wasn't, there wasn't anything that built any kind of animosity before that moment. Everything was perfect in the perfect little world. And then suddenly... There's a, there's all these birds coming at them and a, and attacking them for no real Kamikaze reason. Kamikaze style, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And birds exploding. How are the yeah. birds exploding? <laughs> <laughs> it's just. And the thing is, like, it's just so chaotically done. And the first half is so dull. And the thing is, you know the title. It's not like it's a hidden title of being like, oh, I never thought there would be a bird at the end just attacking people. At least with. Just damn it. The, the weird thing with this film is like you have to acknowledge that in some weird way this is someone's attempt to try and do Hitchcock. Which, yeah. which <laughs> you're just like, <laughs> why try? But if you one mean, guy yeah. nails birds, don't try and be like, you know what, we're going to be the next best thing with birds. <laughs> yeah, and I think they, they tried to tie in that environmental argument um, oh, in this God, really okay. sort of heavy-handed... <laughs> It didn't make sense. Well, no, Karen, it was so loose. popped up and they would just be like, hi, I'm here to educate you for a second and look a bit smug. Yeah, it was like they were, they were on a quest where they stopped and met someone and he told them something and it felt like a computer game yeah. that never really had any sort of Narrative. proper drama. They just had to shoot out of the car all the time. And, you know, like, 
Uh, there was yeah, it was it was like playing GTA, but really really shit. Like <laughs> G- <laughs> well, like GTA what GTA two or something, or you know with the, the crap stick graphics and stuff. Yeah. The thing is, with these sort of films, as like being like indie filmmakers, you have to appreciate that sure they don't have the budgets, mm. but there still has to be some sort of creativity in how they're displaying it, and. You know, the, the way they show their CGI scenes uh, beyond questionable. And, and again, that first 45 is so dull, the way it's shot and the way it's edited and the way the storytelling is. And you're like, Jesus Christ, where's the birds? When you see the birds, you're like, these are the birds? These are the birds? Well, well that's the thing, isn't it? If, uh, like, you know, we, we all know that, that when you make something with very little money, you've got to just use what you can and do what you can with what you've got. But you, we so, have, but, you have limitations, don't so you? And so you have to build things in the right way, in the right places, so you know that you can get good actors to do good performances. And so, you know, if the birds don't look very real, as long as you've got a good narrative and a good other elements of it going on, you can kind of get away with it. I mean, you know, it's still bad CGI, but, like, I mean, you couldn't get away with that CGI, to be fair. Could, you have to do a bit um, more work on that. I think, yeah, the the CGI is terrible. The acting is just awful. The, like, right at the start of this uh, film, we establish our main character. I can't even remember his name. But um, he's a salesman. But he's your stereotypical salesman that's like, yeah, I'm the best. And it's like, him, yeah. And uh, yeah. his mate in his office basically turns around to him at one stage. It's like, how much was the deal for? One million dollars. And it's like so cheesy. And whenever he meets the bird, or meets the girl, sorry, he, um, yeah, he, it's just, it's so, I've seen robots do better performances. I could I could imagine a robot doing a better performance because it's so, like, it's what, rigid and, yeah. hi, I met you in school. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah. yeah. You, you do we, kind of wonder at what point did these characters actually fall for each other because they just seemed awkward did, yeah. throughout the yeah. whole thing. There was never any chemistry between them, um, which is... Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've never seen... Well, I know, I, these, some of these other films... Yeah, well, yeah. this is the thing. When you look at the common trends within the other films, The Room and any of Neil Breen's films, there is always the most awkward, romantic, love forced. interest. Yeah, forced relationship that you as an audience are forced because you're supposed to be like, these are my main characters, these are my protagonists. They're not anti, you know... And like the worst of all those cases is with, with The Room. And the funny thing with The Room is we talk about Birdemic being really cheap and knowing not what the hell to do with anything. Yeah. Mm. The Room costs six million. Yeah. <laughs> and you How know, do you make that out of six million? I yeah. Mean, I don't think it's... We well, kept doing reshoots it. and stuff. Oh, not reshoots, but retakes. Yeah, like, no, well, no, he, loads he was, of takes. Yeah, he did loads of takes. He was shooting on both digital and and uh, film at the same time because he didn't know which one was better. Um, you know, he was building sets of alleyways when they were shooting like just a little bit away from an alleyway. Like, it's, just, <laughs> it's just madness. It's kind of a, a person who wanted to make a film but just honestly is not like don't let him near a camera he doesn't know what he's doing well, the, the, the room also has this sort of this, this delusion of, of like positivity uh, that, that the bird e- birdemic has before the birds turn up where everyone is so lovely to each other and everyone is so good and the main character is such a swell guy who's, yeah. you know, who's loved by everyone um, and it's a really like it, 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 but the room is that for the entirety of it. There is no, except for the moment when Johnny finds out that, <laughs> that Lisa's <laughs> torn him apart. Yeah. <laughs> and then it turns into martyrism. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. But I think w- with with the room, something that uh, you know that that it <laughs> that it manages to do worse than worse than Birdemic is is some of the editing. Like some of the, I mean, the editing isn't great in Birdemic. But but the we, we all know that Neil Bream wins. When it comes to <laughs> well, yeah, editing. yeah, yeah. Neil Bream is the, is the master of bad editing. Oh god, like that's the thing. There's there's a common thread between like all these films because we we don't need to sit there and explain to you all the stories of the films. Like, oh, well, I mean, like the storyline. We we don't need to, you know, go. Go out and watch these films and then force your friends to watch them and then sit and watch with those people <laughs> and watch them have nearly like a. <laughs> 
I'm not, I'm not saying like a mental breakdown, but you see a lot of stages of frustration. It's a like lot an of existential overly... crisis, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's it's a like... lot of, why am I doing this? Why am I watching <laughs> like this? Self-torture. <laughs> to keep going, though. And, and you don't get that with a lot of things except from horror. You don't get that from other genres. And it's weird that that... that it's not really a genre of bad movies. But to have that joint experience of watching someone that you've already been through that experience mm. and you're finding different levels of crap in the film. <laughs> you know? It's a beautiful it's experience. Like, I mean, I when think they think, you, well, when you think that they've done enough crap, they just layer it with more yeah. crap and you're yeah. like, oh my God. What I love about watching these bad movies is, is you're, you're really watching someone's passion project that, the, it, and they've put all of themselves into it. So yeah. there is a lot about their psychology yeah. that's oh, in yeah. those films. Those and Tommy Wiseau's, uh, like, so, so sexist, but, like, in a way that he doesn't think he is in the slightest. What's the thing is, and they that's all quite, are. That's just funny to see. It's but so he's still lorded stupid. as well. Like, like you said earlier, is that people still love him, but yeah, th that must be a subconscious sort of reflection of how he views himself in real life well, yeah, to a certain extent. But I, I, think, I think that actually, in a way, the fans of Tommy Wiseau have kind of done a disservice to, to the, like, by, by sort of supporting him rather than... I mean, he he's not a he's not a nice guy from no, watching no. that film. He's got some really horrible ideas, and that's not something that should really be supported in that way. I think that it's great to watch them, and it's a lot of fun, and there's so much you can learn from them. But like, well, um, again, like you could the thing is, it's like Neil Breen. Neil Breen, yeah. all the female characters in Neil Breen were all questionable, and oh yeah, in a very different way. Like he, they have absolutely no dimension whatsoever and as like the performance there is always the same sort of we're gonna shout like this <laughs> like that. that was a bit Londony, but you know <laughs> yeah like hello his uh, <laughs> depiction of women is is odd in, yeah. in every film he has a face down uh women sleep face down topless uh, with their arms sprawled out and it, like like they're drowned or something like that. It, it's really, really strange. It is. Does he have a... Correct me if I'm wrong. Does he have a film where someone gets shot and they fall into a pool? Have I just made that up? Oh, yeah, in uh, Double Down. Yeah, yeah, is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's one of the most like, scenes I've ever seen. And, yeah, yeah the, the actress that's clearly not comfortable with the nudity in the slightest. Yeah, yeah, because they're and getting all smoochy and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, wasn't that the scene where he, like, asked her, her to marry him or something? Yeah, this oh, is yeah, 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 yeah. throughout it. It's <laughs> like, what the fuck have you done to this poor actress? <laughs> this, this is the thing, there's... <laughs> Despite the fact that these people clearly have the most arrogant egos possible. But that's what you're laughing at. Yeah, but there's well, but there's also one of the other reasons why these films are like beloved and why we love them so much is there is like a certain amount of naivety. Because mm. they think they're doing good in film. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like when you watch Sharknado or something like that where there's a cynicalism mm. where they're being like, oh, we know we're bad. We've got the worst actors in Boswell. Ha ah. ha ha. These people had the intentions that they thought they were doing something good. And that makes it so much more funnier. Yeah. And that sounds yeah. really horrible, but but there's more. That's that's why, like, when you look at um, the films, um, the behind the scene films, like Disaster Artists, Dolmite is my name, and Ed Wood, they're brilliant because they're comedy films, mm. and you're seeing that these people genuinely thought they were doing something good. Yeah. But I think I, I, I mean I think that the. The, the Room and, and Neil Breen's work and, and Birdemic as well comes from a, a slightly different place because it doesn't... Well, Birdemic maybe, maybe is more so, but it feels like those films are just someone throwing an awful lot of money at them with Neil Breen and Tommy Wiseau. They've thrown a lot of money into these films and they don't really have a very good idea other than other than to build themselves up to be well, something like more than human or, or, or superhuman genius, all these things. And it, it essentially it's just a big ego project. And That's the weirdest thing, especially with Neil Breen, because like most of them, Tommy Wasu's done a lot of, you know, post the room things, which are very much, look, I know my humour, haha, and they're awkward and uncomfortable. <laughs> the Birdemic guys, they did Birdemic too. Yeah. Neil Breen <laughs> has a whole back catalogue of strangeness just yeah. sitting there with the weirdest, always with a Jesus complex and a bit of a, he's an alien from the future. Yeah. He's always going to kill a bunch of bankers at the end. Like some yeah. of his ethics, you're like, okay, I get what you're doing, but not what you're, 
this kind is to make. mental. This yeah. is yeah. this is crazy. There's We've no seen... real clear story. Either. Yeah, he gets bored halfway through stories. It's yeah. just, what, <laughs> it's just it kind of, well, it, well, not that what, it ever what was starts. That one, the, the one where he's an author at first, and then suddenly he's a computer hacker. Faithful findings. Faithful findings. Yeah. Um, that film doesn't know. It can't settle on a narrative. He's got. It's constantly like, oh, but maybe I could be this, or maybe I could be that. And it's fucking. It's it's, it's fantastic. That, that's to just the one. Watch. That's he's the one like, where he ends up in the desert or something. And he's got he's like, always in the desert. He's got no Wi-Fi, but yet somehow he's hacking into. Yeah, double that's double. Oh, is it? But he does a lot of computer hacking. He's very obsessed with computer hacking. It's. Uh, this is the thing. There's so many crazy little elements of, like you said before, like it's ego boosting. But they're the he worst just wants films to hack ever. Stuff. And, <laughs> I, you know, the film would be boring without those films. Yeah. You know, well, I, I feel like Neil Neil Breen particularly is like a, he's a he's a libertarian. So he 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 wants to get rid of all of the like the bankers, the corrupt people. But he he also thinks that you know they need to send immigrants back to their country, and that was something that he put in one of his films. Was like I've killed all the bad guys, people in your country. Now go home and deal with it there. Like <laughs> it's, it's really it's really bizarre and fucking stupid. The whole I can film, imagine him doing that. You've been following these um like refugee characters hiding out. They've been kidnapped by oh, people God, and God. and all of that stuff. And then at the end, he just. You know, clicks his fingers and everyone who ever did anything wrong dies or something, and then he just sends the refugees back. <laughs> See, the thing is, what? like, how is that? Even a you story? telling me that, I'm just like, what? <laughs> you can weirdly appreciate the ridiculousness of these films, you know, because they're bad and they're terrible and they're awful ideas and they've all come together, and you're like, how the hell did any of this work? When you get to, like, um, other really bad films like evangelical Christian films <laughs> oh, that's a whole different level because that film is designed to manipulate from the start it is there to push an agenda and because they don't have a clue what they're doing in any filmmaking sense the humour level is at a whole time oh know. yeah it's hilarious <laughs> it's to easier to laugh at them and not feel so like you know well at least they're doing something because it's more like <laughs> why are they trying to do this why there's a film um What's Miracle Man. Miracle Man, yeah. Miracle Man. That is a film you want to search out on YouTube to see some of the most questionable editing possible. And, and green screen. That, that, uh, was, that got all of the... It, <laughs> and they were doing green screen scenes in like restaurants. So the characters were clearly on... like It was very obvious because the lighting was so badly done. And they also couldn't get the, um, the, the framing right of the... You know, where the, where the horizon line is on the, on the background and everything. So you'd be jumping from like a, a, a two shot of them, like a, a conversation, uh, going up to a close up. But obviously they couldn't match up the green screen of where it was. So like every time you moved, it was just like widely out of proportion. <laughs> mad, totally mad. And I don't know how anyone watched that and didn't see that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. But again, they don't see it because they don't think about it and they just release it. And you, you think you about get, like, you get well. You think about a load of different films, right? One of the things that you notice with Neil Brennan is that he likes to use stock footage quite a lot. Oh, God, he does. And in between, like, let's just say general films. It, we've done it in our films. You have tra uh, uh, oh. transitions. <laughs> yeah, you have transitional shots. So maybe it's a, a place or a monument or people. You know, I just feel like Neil Brennan doesn't understand the transitional <laughs> shot. It's yeah, just yeah. there's like. Where it should be one, there's like four. And it, then there's, like, yeah, it's just plastered. There's so many small and little it, easy mistakes Loads of stock. Well, it's, the same <laughs> with the, it's the same with the room as well. All of those like shots of, of um, San Francisco. I mean, I don't know if it was... But I don't think it's as not. bad as but Neil Breen. No, no. Neil Breen, Neil Breen has seen stock footage online and thought, like, I can... That looks good. I can just use a lot of this <laughs> and talk over the top of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what were you saying the other day? We were having this conversation. You were saying you reckon that he did it like he just does a monologue at the <laughs> yeah uh, I, I, and he, he could he could well have just turned on a cassette and started talking about how he was a fantastic hacker and then and got the whole uh, a whole soundtrack I don't know why I said cassette there <laughs> yeah. what, 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 well what it is a no, I'm thinking of the room that's yeah. why <laughs> he, he's got the cassette in the room anyway <laughs> You could get a sound recorder, and uh, he could have he could have just literally uh, said that entire narrative just off the cusp, 
just like playing off his own ego, his own fantasy, being a little kid running around a playground in his mind again. Um, and and uh, yeah, then just shot all the footage afterwards. I think that is a, a genuinely could be how he made that film. I think film. he could be onto something. <laughs> the thing with these films as well, like you end up binge watching them. You start desperately searching for more. There's like Manos, Hands of Fate, and just so many terrible films. Yeah. Do you know what would be really cool? And maybe, you know, an attempt to interact with anyone who's listening out there. Why not leave us a comment of other really bad films? Yeah, yeah. Because we love to, you know, chill out, have a bit of a, you know, and... <laughs> and a bit and, of a, you know. <laughs> and watch some bad movies. <laughs> so, guys, moving on. Sam actually had the pleasure of speaking to one of our colleagues and someone we've worked with in the past, Katrina Gray. Um, we've actually worked with her. Um, on Decline, which will hopefully be out towards the end of this year, start of next year. So look out for that. Um, but other than that, hope you enjoy, guys. Take it away, Sam. Right, I'm on the Trash Arts Take with Katrina Gray. And uh, yeah, how are you doing, Katrina? Hi, I'm great. And you? I'm doing pretty well. It's uh, raining like crazy and it's in the morning, but no, it's good. Oh, thank you for having me on your podcast. I'm really honoured. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Now, uh, Katrina, I got lucky to work with last year. We worked on Decline with uh, Ryan. And yeah, like it was an absolute joy working with you. And I'm really happy that we get to learn a little bit more about you on the podcast today. Awesome. Yeah, I'm um, glad to be part of Decline as well. It's going to be an awesome movie and uh, it was something different than I was doing until now. So very exciting times. Yeah, no, definitely. So uh, the first question is, what made you want to be an actress? Oh, what made me? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I since I was a little girl, literally, I was doing uh, theatre. Uh, uh, my first theater play was when I was five and was playing Ladybug. <laughs> and from then, um, I was studying uh, performing arts, singing and dancing. And in high school, I was doing musicals in Mexico, where I was studying in a high school in Mexico, in Spanish. So it was interesting. And then after, I, um, I had a thought of pursuing acting uh, professionally, but somehow I got into it and uh, was doing modeling for a few years and after full on full time acting basically yeah so it's a it was something that I haven't chosen really myself it was something that was literally I think in my destiny I think because all these opportunities just came across so I was just grabbing them you know that's fantastic that's really cool and it's like obviously with um with having different education in different places, is there a particular kind of roles that sort of attract you? Is there kind of characters you want to play? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I there are certain things that I have on my mind that I would love to do, like the genre. So I definitely love horror and um, sci-fi and fantasy and so, for example, I haven't done fantasy yet, but I did sci-fi, and uh, there are certain roles that I would like to do, like, more like, a, if I com mm, compare it, it would be maybe like a Scarlett Johansson kind of roles that she, she does also drama, she does historical, but action as well, like a strong female roles, but that are also like kind of sensitive, and uh, they're like more in them, it's, uh, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, it's interesting you say about the, because um, I know that you've done a lot of variations with, um, you've done a lot of drama stuff, but you do do a lot of action scenes and you've done a lot of action yeah, I films. Do action. I, I do action because I really enjoy doing on-screen fighting. Um, in my, the recent movie I've done um, is called Bella Ban Hidap. It's actually a Malaysian zombie movie oh, nice. um, coming out in theatres this December. So... Um, so it was funny, no, not funny, <clears throat> it was fun to shoot because it was lots of zombies and it was in Malaysia and uh, I get to do some action and be strong, agent nice. kind of role. And um, yeah, and in contrast, just now, the Serpent BBC series, so it was a drama, proper drama. And 
yeah, so it's I do like either proper drama or action or uh, like combination of both. But um, yeah, so it's just interesting characters that are something completely that I am in normal life. That's what I like when it's completely out of something normal. Yeah. You've had quite a quite well. You've been quite like lucky in response to being able to film in so many different can, uh, countries. So like like yeah, last year you were a miserable Portsmouth in the rain shooting decline, and as you just said, you're in Mal- you just shot a zombie film in Malaysia, and I know you've been doing a lot of work in Thailand, and you've got the experience in Spain. What are the different kind of like um, comparisons or experiences with filming in different countries? I think it's great. Um, actually, it was not Spain, but Mexico. Ah, because yes, that's okay. I, how I, I got there. Um, I got a scholarship to finish my high school in Mexico. So I was, uh, the school provided the program of uh, being able to join the theater, local theater. So that's why I was doing alongside my studies, m- musicals, basically. And uh, mm, so that one was proper musical, but they also shot it. So it was on DVD. And uh, uh, I think it's great. Like first time I did modeling, it was when I went to Hawaii because my part of my family uh, lives in Hawaii because they emigrated in '68 when the, just before the borders closed. So I have a Slovak family there, and um, so I I was going there for summers, uh, and then that's where I learned English as well. So that's where I started the modeling. So it was fun, you know, I enjoyed like, mm, this is fun to shoot. And what, what, you know, what else is out there? And then, and then I went to Thailand and uh, did some more commercials and then film castings. And from then it's just went on and on. And uh, for example, the Malaysian job I got because the director saw me in the theaters in a ghost movie, ghost house movie, which was ah, very yeah, saw that successful. Film. Yeah. Yeah, so he he really like he so he saw me in the th- in Malaysia in the theater. So I was like, oh, this actress is in actually Thailand. So he got in touch with me, and then he casted me to his project. And uh, yeah, so uh, and you know, Ghost House did very well distribution wise. It was you know every country around the world, and it it was for so many weeks in Asia. So it was just running. Everyone loves ghost movies, and um, so and it's also kind of very typical for Thailand as well. Um, so you should watch it. It's a good movie. <laughs> yeah, you can actually. Uh, I believe it's still on Netflix UK, so you can still catch still, that on yeah. Netflix. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. Like you, you, I've spoken to a lot of uh, actors and directors across the world, and there's not many like you who actually get the opportunity to work with so many different uh, filmmakers from across the world and it kind of feels like that's not going to stop anytime soon you, you seem to have almost got that niche of getting that interest from so many different cultures that are interested in what you offer which is pretty cool uh yeah i mean i i feel very um, blessed and thankful that you know all these opportunities comes but um i guess it's just you have to be you know ready anytime and uh, be very flexible when it comes to time because you never know when it comes you know the casting comes and you have to be ready to go anywhere so but um yeah so like last year i done nine film projects so i think it was so far the most successful year the last year but I'm sure I'm definitely not planning to retire or anything <laughs> like that. I love acting too much. And, uh, um, you know, as you know, I'm making my own projects as well. And yeah, last but... year I produced uh, another another movie, a uh, shark movie. So uh, I, I am main actress, but I'm the producer as well. So I did the whole production, same as with Daytime Nightmare. So, so that yeah, is also coming... Tell us a bit more about um, Daytime Nightmares, because that's you stepping into directing as well as starring. And I've seen the teaser trailer, and it's really, really cool. So, yeah, tell yeah, us a bit more. So, Daytime Nightmare, um, it's a psychological thriller horror, and uh, it's uh, basically Lucy's life changes when her own mind turns against her and her nightmares become her daymares. So I wanted to show something. Um, I, want, I, I wanted to show uh, like nightmare disorder 
in form of the film and uh, hopefully will reach out the audience in the way like so many people have a nightmare so I wanted to show, bring them into a movie and show them in the real life as well like how the kind of blend of schizophrenia and nightmare disorder something that mo nobody has done movie about yet but um, and make it very personal you know so people can maybe even relate to it relate to it a bit and uh, find themselves in it like oh I had that kind of nightmare myself you know so and it's very personal to me so I, I put everything into this movie still working on it now we are finishing the music which is composed by Randy Kelsey he did the whole post -pro post production and we are like doing it very high quality and uh, that's why it took a long time as well and we were not rushing it and it's my first uh, feature film my directorial debut and um, so I'm very proud of it so I'm taking my time <laughs> so it's as, as best as it could be so one day when I look back I would say it's the best I could do then no I think like from what I've seen it looks pretty cool and the fact that like it's the scope for such a story that you've just described you expect something a little bit more uh, intimate or a little bit more closed in especially for a first film but from seeing the trailer, like with all the drone shots and everything, there's a much bigger world, and it, it looked well, it looked professional. And that's the one thing I've always noticed with you, Katrina. You you bring a hell of a lot of professionalism to everything you do. Even I remember like last year with the client having all the costumes, and you were just like laying them out and, and just going, "What about this one for this, 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 this?" You've always just wanted to have every single detail to make everything perfect. And I think um, those are qualities that you can only want in directing. So I'm really hoping that. You stepping into directing it will go really well for you, really. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely wanna uh, wanna do some more projects. So that's what I'm working on right now. I'm developing uh, three projects. So hopefully we'll have some more updates soon. And uh, yeah, so finishing a couple of scripts and hopefully ready to shoot another. But um, yeah, definitely this year is gonna be very busy and project wise so definitely keep going and uh but in the same time also um when some acting opportunity comes uh, i'm going for that as well and meanwhile developing my other projects um currently working on hostel paradise which is my original script as well so that's going to be another uh, action thriller nice a little bit of both, yeah I know that we're uh, hoping to develop some stuff for you too. We've got uh, two script ideas we're currently trying to get ready for you, but plenty of time to get those sorted. And I was going to actually ask you what's yeah. next, but you answered it yourself. So I don't need to ask you. So, Could uh, you please repeat this question? <laughs> oh, I was just saying that I was going to ask you what's next, but you sort of already answered yeah. the question. Yeah, so next is uh, House to Paradise. Nice. I really look forward to seeing what you're doing. And like, like I said, everything I've seen is really cool. And uh, yeah, we're hoping to have Decline ready by the end of the year. And maybe even around the same sort of time as Daytime Nightmares. We'll see. Um, thank yeah, you so much. Maybe. Thank you so much for chatting to us, Katrina. I hope, thank you. Uh, thank you very much as well. Yeah, and if there's anything you want to plug just before we finish up, please feel free. Yeah, so anyone who would like to find out more about Daytime Nightmare, we have a Facebook fan page, so feel free to come and check out our um, photos behind the scenes and updates and uh, any kind of news I will share on the fan page. So we will definitely have us soon some kind of news and updates. So feel free to check out and give us a like. It was, I would really appreciate it. It's very important for independent filmmakers to have uh, support from audience, even by clicking, commenting, or liking. Anything helps, right? Completely agree with thank you. And we'll put a link on underneath so people can get to that nice and easy. Well, thank yes, you for talking to us, Katrina. I hope you have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. So, thanks for listening, guys. We hope you enjoyed episode six of Trash Arts Tick. Don't forget... To like, subscribe, and like Sam said, leave a comment. We'd especially like some comments of any kind of terrible films that you've seen. And that would be awesome. Then we can binge. <laughs> so guys, other than that, Trash Arts Tick out. Bye. Ta-da. <laughs>